Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Joseph Hyatt, standing in for Gayatri. There have only been two mayors of London, and half of them are in the studio with me. Both served in Parliament with me. One has decided to go back into Parliament, and I wish the other one had too. The current mayor, Boris Johnson, in true British politician style, has decided to break his pre-election promise that he would never be a part-time mayor and has decided to be one after all, taking, he hopes, a safe outer London Tory seat in Parliament whilst continuing to serve as mayor for the duration of the term. It really ought to be a big scandal, but oddly, it isn't, at least not for yet. London saved the best for first, in my opinion, and so I'm glad to welcome the twice-elected mayor, Ken Livingston. But before we talk to him, we sent Joseph minus the red gloves out onto the streets of London to find out what the public think. It's clearly not a desirable situation to try and combine two important jobs like that. Uh, someone recently pointed out that, of course, a cabinet minister is also trying to do the job of an MP at the same time and ex expected to achieve that, and in many cases do does. So, in fairness to him, I would say that there is a case to be argued for that, but um, Certainly, uh, it, more importantly, he's broken a promise, and I think that reflects badly upon him. Well, I can't be a part-time mayor. He's got to be do all or nothing. And keep him on his bike, because he looks good on his bike. <laughs> he would be part-time, but he'd do a brilliant job. I know that he's very committed to the role in um, City Hall. And as for, with regards to um, doing a role within government, I think they need a shake-up, and he's the right guy to do that as well. I find it very difficult to raise him as a, as a mayor. Uh, I think he talks a lot. I'm not sure about what he's delivered. I think he's great for London. I really like him. Is there any particular reason? What, what would you say is his legacy in his term in office? Um, I think the fun he brings to politics. It seems to be more old people that moan about him. <laughs> I've been very impressed with him over the years, so I'm a big fan of his, and um, just uh, hope he can continue. Obviously, he's going on to become an MP. I hope he can do justice to both roles. Who's that? Uh, he's the mayor of London. Oh, you mean the guy that does all the buses and trains and stuff? Some would say with the funky hair. Big white one. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, don't really know much about him. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the voice of the public, a mixed uh, voice, of course. Ken, am I, am I barking up the wrong tree here? Is it a big issue that he's broken this promise? Well, clearly not, because, I mean, in the first place, he hasn't really done the job of mayor. I mean, the only two things he's initiated in the last six years are uh, that Orbit restaurant that overlooks the Olympics um, and the cable car to nowhere. The one that he got stuck on. <laughs> the one he got stuck on. So the, the real problem is that he hasn't initiated the things, because all projects take a long time, that the next mayor will open. The mayor is elected in 2016, will find they've got to move pretty fast or London will be seizing up. Tell me what you think his biggest failures have been. What had you planned to do that he hasn't done and what have we paid uh, in terms of price for well, that? Well, when, when he got in, he cancelled all the projects that I had underway except the bike scheme. So the extension of the tram... So these bikes that everyone calls Boris bikes yeah, they're, they're, are actually Ken's bikes? We, I commissioned it about oh, 10 months before we lost the election. But we were going to extend the Croydon tram into Bromley. We were going to build a cross-river tram to ease the pressure on the northern line. We were going to take over, and the Labour government agreed this, the suburban rail lines, the mayor would control the franchise, you could upgrade all that. But the big thing, I persuaded the Labour government to give the mayor powers over housing. And, I mean, he inherited £5 billion from Gordon Brown's government to start building 50,000 affordable homes. Hasn't done it at all. I, I, I remember saying to him at one point, you've got to start building homes for rent. And he said, homes for rent? And there was shock in his voice. I, I'd asked if I could sleep with his wife or something. And you realise... This layer of Tory elite, they never have a housing problem. Their parents give them one or they inherit one or whatever. They have no idea what it's like to struggle day by day in such an expensive city as London. Now, 
as I said in the mm. introduction, uh, I have always been a great admirer of yours. I was a great admirer of your mayoralty. It is astounding, isn't it? Perhaps not after mm. the Vox Pops we've just watched, that a Bullingdon club, mm. upper class, semi-aristocrat, mm. buffoon and joker, mm. a man who's made a career out mm. of appearing a kind of Bertie mm. Wooster character, mm could get the million-plus votes that mm. were required to beat you. It's, How did that it, happen? It's even worse. At the moment, over half of Labour voters think he's doing a reasonable job. And I, largely this is because he is very clever behind all the buffoonery. Everything he's done has been about promoting himself. So all people see on telly is this, this nice man at a charity event opening this, making them laugh. Um, and he's courted relentlessly. And you, if you look at his expenses um, statements and so on, I, the, the, the editors and the owners of the Evening Standard have paid for him to have holidays in Italy. They paid for the car to pick him up at the airport and bring him home. He takes the owners of the Telegraph out, the, the Barclay brothers. He, caught, he took Murdoch to the Olympic Games at the height of the investigation into the criminality of the Murdoch Empire. He has focused on keeping the five billionaires who control 70% of our papers online. So there's never the investigation. Now, I'm, everything I did was under a microscope by these people. It's unremitting pressure. And I'm not saying that shouldn't happen. I just regret the fact they're not doing it to, to Johnson. Mm. He is an enormously uh, charming character, mm. it's clear. And what is clear from the Vox Pops, including the ones we didn't have time to mm. show, is that he has a big support amongst women. Mm. In a way, this is depressing because it seems yeah. to teach the lesson that people are interested in the froth mm. rather than the mm. substance. The, you heard one woman mm. there say he brings fun mm. into politics. Is one of our, our well, problems that we're a bit too serious? Well, you see, I, I didn't come into politics because I wanted to be loved. I came into politics to do things, and that's, that's what our generation did. Um, and one thing that surprised me, I assumed Boris was this hardline right-wing ideologue behind all the charm, and he would set a new right-wing agenda at City Hall. And really broadly, he's just patted on, leaving things pretty much as I left them, put the fares up and all that. Um, hasn't done anything very much. And I think those right-wing Tories who are going to vote for him to be their next leader will be bitterly disappointed if he does become Prime Minister because he's not like Thatcher. He hasn't got a, a, wor a world view about how things should be. It's just about promoting himself. If you know, Boris served out his term, he could then get into Parliament in a by-election quite easily. Some old Tory would stand down. But he's expecting the Tories are going to lose. There's going to be a leadership election. And I think he's right. I do think the Tories will lose the next election. And I think it's going to be very interesting because as leader of the opposition, you won't be. You can't manage the media in the way I mean, you you do in this mayoral job. It's half an hour every week, prime minister's questions. He's got to have detail. He's got to have some serious policies. I think you might find a lot of people realise they made a mistake once he's exposed to that sort of attention. I mean, obviously, mm. if I may say so, we have two mm. great examples of two individuals who came into politics with a good heart, mm. good ethics, and, and hard graft. Mm. But essentially, I mean, we, we saw it from the young viewers, she wasn't very much aware of Boris Johnson, that the feedback from, from the younger mm. viewers there was that um, they're not really in tune with, with his politics. Mm. Um, you know, as a viewer watching this, would it be possible to... I mean, do you really think there's a future for young people to, to have hard graft and good hearts getting into politics? I mean, the... My advice to the people is do something before you get into politics. You know, I, mean, I spent eight years as a technician at Kent's research unit. You know, I had a, something else in life before I got completely caught up in all of this. And I mean, one of our weaknesses is that very few people now come into Parliament in their 40s or 50s having achieved something outside it. People come in straight from university and they have no life outside of that. And that undoubtedly weakens um, our political system. But I think what's significant about Boris is you see all these people say very nice things about him, but none of them know him. If you look at the people who worked closely with him, they're scathing. Uh, Max Hastings, who gave him the job uh, for the Telegraph, covering the European Union, and his deputy, Sonia Pennell, who was there for years working with him, are absolutely vitriolic about him. And so behind you know, all this charm, which is very well crafted, is absolutely a completely ruthless and I think quite cold person. Well, we... we are about to perhaps, and Boris Johnson, see a new leader of the opposition. Mm. 
what do you think the, uh, of the job that the current leader of the opposition is doing? You're a, a giant figure well, of left-wing politics in Britain. You, are you content I, that Miliband is headed for victory? And if so, what would be achieved by a victory? Well, I, uh, most certainly Ed Miliband is the last chance in my lifetime of a Labour government that might actually do something. All the Labour governments, I mean, I was only about a couple of months old when the Labour government was, came in after the war that created our welfare state and full employment. I want a Labour government like that. I do think there's a chance Ed Miliband will make real change. Whenever I've been with him, and I, I spent a lot of time with him in the two years I was running, and he was leader of, of the party. I, he's focused on what you could do. He's learning what Germany got right in building a more balanced economy, jobs for working class people in manufacturing. Um, my worry is that he underestimates, I think, the scale of opposition there comes from vested interests, international corporations, the old landed gentry, if you really threaten to make change. Because uh, we've got just about the most unfair tax system in the West, apart from America. If you start saying to the giant corporations, we're going to stop Google and Starbucks not paying any tax, then you've got the money to actually do the things we want, they're going to be difficult. Ken, most people watching this will be thinking you left uh, office uh, too early. I I, well, I really regret now I gave up my seat in Parliament eh, because I would have stood against Gordon Brown. We might have had a very different government. And you could still stand. Get back into the House. <laughs> if, uh, if Miliband won't put you in the upper house, stand for the Commons. I, uh, the idea of being sent to that open prison of the House of Lords has no appeal, you know. Well, the House of Commons misses you. Thanks <laughs> very much indeed. The best mayor of London, Ken Livingstone. Coming up after the break, Iraq's long fall to pieces accelerates and those who broke it have the gall to imagine that they are just the right people to fix it again. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. Around the sand pits in the Newsnight studio, all the old experts are being remobilized. Presenters, analysts and experts who told us with such certainty 11 years ago that if only hundreds of thousands of British and American soldiers would invade and occupy Iraq, everything in the oasis would be rosy. Well, they've now got their military boots on again. Clapped out war horse experts are drafted back from what should have been oblivion to give us the benefit of all the advice that turned out so wrong last time. Yes, we are on the march and headed back to war in Iraq. How's that going to work out? Well, let's ask Sabah Jawad of Iraqi Democrats Against Occupation. He was a victim of Saddam, but nevertheless an opponent of the Bush and Blair War. Let's hear his take on this one. Sabah? Are we on the march back to war with Iraq, and will it do any good? Yeah, there, there seems to be that the American actually and the British, uh, for that matter, are going back to Iraq, uh, and uh, uh, they always say that the criminals always return to the crime scenes, and now we've seen them uh, in, the, in the mountain of Kurdistan, and they're talking about humanitarian missions, and actually and they just discover that the Yazid is no longer uh, stranded on the mountains, and therefore there is no, there is no need for a huge rescue missions. That all turned well. out to shoot their fox, really. They were, they were going to use the plight of a people they had never mentioned to us before, the That's Yazidis, right. uh, as their co cause uh, for the war, their uh, casus belli. Uh, but that's now gone because the Yazidis are actually already gone and the right. local people rescued them, Kurdish people. In fact, they're now safe in Syria. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't this a case in point that the, it's not that we're against uh, intervention in catastrophes, it's that the people in the area, the region... Well, the American, we were sinister, a sinister plan, actually, for Iraq. They never uh, came to term with the... With the with them leaving Iraq in 2011. They always want to maintain some uh, military presence in Iraq. Uh, the Iraqi people refused that and even forced the Maliki government not to give them immunity and, uh, and so on. You remember yeah. the SOFA uh, uh, negotiations and so on. And they never uh, actually were happy with that uh, decision. They utilized what's happening in Mosul and the ISIS attack and occupation of Mosul and uh, the aftermath of that event uh, to 
go back to uh, to Iraq. And uh, with their, uh, first of all, they threatened with the uh, bombardment, air force uh, attacks against uh, ISIS and, uh, and Mosul. And now they're talking about ground troops and the specialist forces and rescue forces and so on, and drone attacks as well. And uh, in the end, they will end up establishing military bases in Kurdistan, the most likely a place for such a military bases in the future. Don't forget that the Kurdish leadership actually offered uh, the Americans uh, permanent military bases in Kurdistan when Maliki was negotiating the SOFA agreement in 2011. Well. Is one of the game plans then to formally break up Iraq so that Kurdistan becomes an independent state? If the American wanted uh, the breakup of Iraq, they would have done it earlier, but actually the Kurdish leadership are more use, uh, useful to the American and the Israeli uh, uh, policy if they remain in Iraq and uh, keep Iraq weak and in a fragmented uh, state without uh, the declaration of independence. But because de facto independence de facto, already. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is what they've been working at. at. This is what, uh, you know, the selling of, illegal selling of Iraqi oil, the occupation of uh, Parts of Iraq which does not belong to the uh, to the Kurdish uh, region, like, most, like uh, uh, Kirkuk, like Kirkuk as well. They, they hold that now. What's going to happen to that? Well, they said the the the, the de facto uh, uh, annexation of that, that uh, part of Iraq, and they say we are not going to return to the status quo. But that includes before. one of. Iraq's two oil fields. Yeah, one a huge oil field as well. And don't forget that I mean, this, the, the, with the conniving of Turkey and the American oil companies, they've been extracting oil and selling it. Um, and all the protestations by the American, actually, they don't like that. And they should be, this, sh this issue should be cleared with the central government. And Iraq is a lie because the American oil companies who are buying uh, these uh, shipments of oil uh, from Iraq mm. illegally. Let's talk about ISIS. We've talked about them many times here before. Let's assume it's a given between us that ISIS is guilty of the most savage barbarism, both in Syria and in Iraq, that they are beyond any kind of pale uh, that would be recognized by any Muslim other than the small takfiri sect that they represent. Let's assume that to be a given. How come they have done so spectacularly well? How come the tribes in the west of Iraq are content to appear at least to be represented by them? How come Saddam's former men in the army and the Ba'ath Party and militia and so on are content to be led by them? I think they are helping. And there's a lot of people asking these questions. Why a uh, kind of a desperate group of uh, um, savages, uh, basically, who come from all over the world, mm, from Chechnya, Britain. Uh, from Britain, and, and so on. They go in there. They've been to Syria, they've been to Lebanon, they've been all, all across the, the Middle East, in Yemen as well. They commit atrocities all over the place. In fact, a lot of people in the Middle East call these ISIS and Daesh and uh, Al-Qaeda, they call them American and Israeli militia in the Arab world because they're going about in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, yeah, uh, Libya, and Lebanon, the occupation of Arsal, for example, uh, and Lebanon as well. Um, it's all part and parcel of uh, uh, a plan, Israeli and American plan, to fragment the Middle East and to weaken the states, whether it's Syrian, Iraqis, and so on. And Iraq is added advantage because the American created a political system, so-called political process, which is based on sectarianism and division. So Iraq actually have no way of developing into an independent, sovereign, uh, powerful state or strongest state because it's been strangled by the political process where you have a situation where actually even the smallest oppositions are part of the system, part of the government, and so on. This does not manufacture strength in Iraq, continuity and, and sovereignty. Therefore, they created this system to, to maintain Iraq as a weak uh, state, and this has encouraged uh, ISIS to expand and to achieve this uh, tremendous victory in Mosul. And don't forget, the Iraqi army did not fight a single shot in, uh, in Mosul. And that's because of the infiltrations by the Americans. They appointed these people and uh, a bribery of the senior Iraqi of officers because uh, when the Paul Bremer disbanded the Iraqi army, they created 
another army which is very corrupt and uh, biased um, in favor of the American and some regional powers as well, you know, like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and uh, other, uh, Turkey, and so on. So the Iraq army did not fight in Mosul. Uh, the, the ISIS meant, uh, got hold of the their weapons. Uh, well, their weapons, and in fact, you find these weapons in Syria. So Syria suffering as a result of uh, ISIS victory in Mosul uh, as well. And, and can they go on to still greater victories? I mean, are these people going to take over the country? It will be very difficult in Baghdad and uh, the south of Iraq, as you know, because of the of the concentrations of uh, you know. Uh, Shiite, Shiite uh, and so on. But I will, they will they try to maintain Iraq in a very weak state, where this is basically bleeding. And with the help of the Kurdish lead leadership, you know, uh, a bleeding Iraq dry in terms of oil and resources, and you have to watch your back all the time. Uh, we have now basically a coup d'etat against the political system, which is the American themselves created. Um, uh, in Iraq, they toppled al-Maliki because they didn't like some aspects of Maliki policies, even so that he's, at the end of the day, he obeys their order, but he did not obey their orders in, in terms of buying arms from the Russians. Uh, he concluded a few deals, a huge deals, to buy arms from the uh, from Russia because the United States refused to sell him arms, despite the security agreement with him, um, because they are worried that Israel actually might be used use to attack Israel. You know, any arms shipment to the Middle East it has to be approved by the Israelis and the Zionist uh, lobby in Congress uh, and so on. And they refused to supply Iraq with the Phantom F-16, despite the fact actually that Iraq paid for these shipments. They paid for them, but they, not received them. They received them. them. And uh, as a result, you see Al-Maliki went to Russia and signed a, a $4 billion agreement with them. Uh, that agreement actually was shelved somehow because of the corruption scandals surrounding it. But at the same time, he just uh, reached an agreement with the Russians uh, once again to to buy more than a billion uh, dollars worth of arms. The Americans didn't like that. And also, al-Maliki was talking about a majority, political majority government in Iraq, which actually go in contradiction to what they plan for Iraq, because the Americans don't like Iraqis to behave as Iraqis. They want Iraqis to behave as a tribal uh, at each other's throat, at, um, uh, Sunni and Shia, uh, Kurdi and Arabi, and uh, and so on. You know, they don't look at third world countries as uh, uh, you know entity, which is a, a national entities and so on. I remember in the past few weeks I saw a program on BBC. I think it was the Newsnight, where the guest was uh, uh, the High Commissioner from uh, Rwanda. And uh, the interviewer actually insisted that he t he'll tell him uh, where is he, whether he's Tutsi or uh, Hutu. And that guy, the high commissioner, refused to say. He said, look, we have to put these kind of things behind us because it brought us tra uh, tragedies to, to um, Rwanda. But they insisted actually on classifying or defining nations at uh, tribal, uh, killing each other or religion or uh, sect sect sectors fighting each other and so on. And this is the, the story in Iraq. This is a story in Lebanon. The French went to Lebanon and it created a sectarian system based on uh, religions and... Uh, Confession, uh, yeah. And the it's an old story. Old story. Divide and rule. and rule. Yeah. And that's exactly uh, what they're trying. Any hope for Iraq? The Iraqi people are very resolute. The Iraqi people will not uh, lie down and let this continue for uh, indefinitely. So in the end, and at the end of the day, we'll be victorious. We will establish a democratic, uh, prosperous, independent Iraq, uh, where uh, not even one soldier or resemblance of American and British soldiers will remain in Iraq. Sabah Jawad, thank you for that powerful message. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Joseph? So, on the subject of Boris Johnson, obviously his legacy in office, uh, Mark Atkinson says he spent his time greasing palms and helping out the chaps to facilitate his bid for leader. Quite a few on the uh, water cannons that he's, of course, commissioned. Uh, 12 o'clock and all's well says, mobile shower units, hashtag water cannons. Well, of course, he has no 
power, he has no legal authority to use these water cannons. The Home Secretary has not agreed that they should be used. Uh, on to the terrible state of Iraq. Um, Aaron Markley says, arming factions in Middle East cause this. Don't see how spending more arms in will help. And finally, Anfield says, uh, aim is to create USA garrison in Kurdish region. I have no doubt that the Americans are going to base themselves there because they currently don't have permission to do so in Iraq. Or rather, they did have the right to base themselves in Iraq, but they would be given no immunity when they broke Iraqi law. And that was the uh, breaking point. And that's all we've got time for for today. Now, you got married yesterday, so congratulations and the best of luck uh, with all that. And now all the viewers know why you're looking so happy. <laughs> Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. It's RT underscore Sputnik. And of course, we're on Facebook. It's Sputnik on Russia Today. But for one final time, it's goodbye from me, Joseph Hyatt. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.